I wanted to talk about the importance of a tech industry to resilience. I really love the theme of this event. And I want to talk about some of the things that need to happen education-wise to continue supporting that. So just a little bit about me. So born and raised in Hamilton, I could do the Oski Wee Wee before I could walk sort of thing, uh, that kind of person. Um, then I went to uh, McMaster University. I've been there for like 11 years now. I'm just finishing up my PhD now. Um, studied computer science the whole way, did a bachelor's, master's, now I'm on to my PhD. Um, while I was at McMaster, something really depressing happened. All of my friends were leaving. Every year when uh, a class would graduate, they would all leave for jobs in Toronto, Waterloo, if I was lucky, more likely New York, Silicon Valley. And I tried to figure out what's going on here. Why are all my friends leaving? Um, so I did a survey, and uh, this was unofficial. I'm surprised I haven't gotten in trouble for this. But I did a survey of current students and alumni. I found out that 94% of them were coming in from outside of Hamilton. Um, most of them, the vast majority of them, were open to staying in Hamilton, but there was very few jobs here. In fact, the only people that I found that actually stayed in Hamilton after graduating from the computing software program were from Hamilton originally. And from this, I, I see two problems. Um, oops. All right, so, wait, there's two problems. There's a job problem and an education problem. Um, so the job problem was that uh, students weren't aware of the fact that we had jobs here. The other problem was um, Hamiltonians weren't uh, going into uh, computer science as a, as a field. Um, looking at tackling the first problem, um, a lack of uh, a tech community and a lack of awareness about a tech community. In Silicon Valley, they had something called the Homebrew Computer Club. This is when the, the tech geeks, like Steve Jobs and Bill Gates, actually, this, they were part of this. They got together, they started talking about technology and the importance of the industry in Silicon Valley, and they started building a uh, community there. Um, so, you know, I'm trying to emulate some of this here um, with uh, Software Hamilton, I called it. And it was a, it's a blog, there's a... Um, article every day covering the tech community in Hamilton. There's a job board to keep track of the amount of jobs in Hamilton. And uh, also importantly, I organized this event called Demo Camp. And uh, Demo Camp, we started three years ago today, actually three years ago today. It's launched the Irish pub. We had about 80 or 90 people out. It's a tech show and tell. People show off their app, they show off their website, um, and they get feedback from the community. It grew to about the last one we had like last summer at the Art Gallery of Hamilton, we had over 200 people there. And the tech community in general in Hamilton is exploding. Um, it's not just software Hamilton events, there's all kinds of people that have stepped up to lead different things like Ladies Learning Code and Hacker Saturdays and Startup Weekends and all different kinds of events to galvanize our community here. Um, and this, this community plays a catalyst role, kind of connects people, in increases awareness and whatnot. Um, but uh, it's not the growth. The growth is really coming from these companies, these entrepreneurs that have set up shop here and are creating jobs. Um, and if you look at the job board, the first year we had about uh, 11 jobs on there. Second year we had uh, 44. Last year we had 102, so really good growth. In the first two months of this year, we've had 44 jobs posted. Um, if you project that out, we're looking at you know, over 250 jobs this year. So it's becoming a pretty significant uh, industry. Um, it's all good, right? Uh, problem solved. Uh, jobs are here, all great. Um, something strange happened. Um, we were only getting about 1.4 applications per job. It turns out this isn't, this isn't um, atypical for the tech industry. And this takes us back to the education problem. That's what I want to talk about uh, for the rest of today, is uh, what's happening here that on the one hand we're creating all these jobs, on the other hand we have uh, resiliency through innovation as a theme because we've sometimes failed to be resilient. Looking at Hamilton employment and poverty, um, only about 50% of people in Hamilton have the traditional middle-class full-time job with benefits. Uh, a lot of people are stuck in precarious employment, so things like part-time work, unpaid internship, contract work, and whatnot. And we've got this Code Red series that's done a good job of documenting uh, the poverty in Hamilton and uh, the amount of suffering that's going on. If we step back and look at the big picture, though, this isn't just the Hamilton issue. This is something that's happening um, all over, um, where, you know, the amount of participation in the labor force has declined, say, in the U.S. The um, part-time versus full-time work, and part-time work has surged, full-time work has declined. Um, we've seen a huge disparity in, in income gap. We keep, we keep hearing about the income gap. Um, so this isn't just a Hamilton problem. This is a problem all over. Um, so what's happening is uh, we're part of a broader trend here. Um, there's a lot of frustration over this. A lot of people are legitimately uh, like pissed off, for lack of a better term, about what's happening uh, and outsourcing and, you know, 
greed is something that comes up a lot. And the truth is, um, this is, a, this is a big problem. This is a big reason why jobs have left. That's a whole other TED talk. I don't want to tackle it from this angle today. But um, we've had outsourcing for a long time. We've lost entire industries before, and we've had new industries. And we are having new industries come in again. What that new industry looks like now is increasingly um, tech-related. So there's this saying now that software is eating the world, that um, software is basically the new backbone of the economy. It's, it's what's disrupting major industries. Best example of this that I can uh, think of off the top of my head is, uh, has anyone been to a Blockbuster lately? <laughs> no, because Netflix just kind of crushed them, and so did Xbox Live and all these other things, right? Um, and that's what's happened to all these industries, is that um, software is so pervasive now with smartphones, tablets, uh, consoles, PCs, everything, that uh, it is taking over large industries. Um, and it isn't always what you expect. So something like Walmart, you might not expect to think of them as a tech company. But one of the reasons why Walmart was able to crush its competition is that they had a very sophisticated uh, logistics and distribution network that was powered by software. They had that before anybody else, and that's one of the things that differentiated them. So it's not just like, oh, you know, um, Microsoft kind of tech we're talking about here. So does this mean we're done? Are we just like obsolete and, you know, these guys are going to take over now? Um, no. Uh, and I love this cartoon or this uh, comic because of that. Um, you know, you see uh, in the 90s there, computers were beating humans at chess. And then, I think it was like a year or two ago, they had Watson that IBM created uh, beating people at Jeopardy. And it's kind of scary because it's like, oh, well, is there anything we can do? Those computers didn't program themselves. Um, it's it's uh, that skill that we can still do that will always be around because these computers, will, they're not going to be able to program themselves. So this change is very fundamental. Uh, we've gone through a fundamental change like this before. Best thing I can think of in terms of a change as fundamental would be the change from craftsmen to assembly lines. So back in the day, you had craftsmen that were making, say, a master carpenter would be an expert at making a table. And then Henry Ford came along and said, you're going to be on a line and you're going to put in the same screw every day the same way, and that line's going to keep moving. And that turned out to be way more efficient at producing things. That just took over. Uh, assembly lines became the new thing, the new way of making things. Now it's better to write a program that'll tell it how to do that thing over and over again. And automation is that new job. It's that new assembly line kind of job. And this is a scary statistic, but it's very likely true. Uh, Oxford researchers are saying that over the next 20 years, 50% of jobs out there are going to be automated or computerized, basically. So the way to look at this is that this is kind of like the new economic backbone. Not everyone was a steel worker 100 years ago, but the steel workers were the producers of things that created an economic spin-off that created more jobs because, you know, they needed bakers, they needed farmers to buy goods for, they needed hospitals, people to take care of them, whatnot. It's like the backbone of the economy, the main producing uh, part of the economy. Um, so not everyone's going to be a software developer in this new economy, but these jobs do create a lot of spin-off. Um, looking at San Francisco, this Forbes article, um, for every uh, computing and computer systems job created, it created about 3.35 other jobs in the economy. So there's a powerful ripoff effect when you get these jobs. And the metros, the, the cities that get this, are flourishing. Of the top 20 cities in the US, uh, in terms of economic growth uh, and job creation since the recession, um, software publishing is a major driving force. Um, we could significantly reduce unemployment if we fill these jobs quick enough. If we, if we fill one of these jobs, we're going to create more jobs. And then we fill those jobs and we create more jobs and we get that healthy business cycle. Um, but we can't just do that. Waterloo has 2,000 unfilled tech jobs. This is a very big problem. And the problem isn't so much job creation as it is job skills mismatch. We have a very well-educated workforce at this point. We've done a very good job at encouraging people to go to university, take on post-secondary education. But the ROI, the return on investment on this type of education is diminishing at this point. Um, if we look at... Uh, how college graduates are, are placing, only about half the people that are getting college degrees are actually ending up in jobs that require a college degree. So we're kind of mismatching uh, education at this point. And so we need to refocus our post-secondary efforts towards more bread and butter type education where there's going to be higher ROI opportunities for us. So we need to reprioritize on career-focused education. 
Um, we need to better inform high school students that when they go into post-secondary, they need to be aware of what career opportunities they're going to have coming out of that. We also need to put an emphasis on two-year and three-year diplomas again, because I'm teaching at Mohawk College now, and they are learning skills that will directly get them a job. And that's a good thing, and it shouldn't be looked down upon. It should be something that's celebrated. It's something that's good for society. The ROI is going to be very high. Um, because tech jobs are more than uh, programming. Uh, tech jobs, um, it's also computer support, being able to deal with somebody on the phone, help them through some kind of computer issue. Uh, it's also being able to use a computer, do some system analysis kind of stuff. It's not just uh, computer programming. Um, I never thought that I would care about um, adult literacy. I didn't even know that this was a thing. I thought, oh, Canada is 99% literate. But it turns out that um, many Canadians aren't uh, literate enough to get one of these knowledge economy jobs. So you can't um, get one of these jobs if you don't have high literacy skills. And about 40% of uh, Canadians don't have uh, high enough literacy skills for these kinds of things. And uh, a lot of impoverished adults uh, don't have the literacy skills to get into these training programs that could get them these jobs. Um, and the ROI here is extremely high, uh, extremely high ROI. It's crazy to me, I'll, I've done research now with these literacy centers, and it's crazy to me how um, they're surviving from grant to grant when this is so important um, to, to the economy, and yet universities, which I mean I love them, are uh, very well funded. Um, so the problem is, uh, this is really nice pie in the sky stuff, how do we pay for all this refocusing and re-emphasizing of education? Because um, debt to GDP ratios, this is for the US, but debt to GDP ratios are just skyrocketing all over. Governments don't just have money to just throw around. Um, and what we need to do is we need to introduce more technology into the classroom to save costs. This is the research that I do, this is like uh, something that I care about a lot. Uh, so the last couple of years now, I've been making apps for tablets, bringing them into classroom situations, testing them out and see how they work uh, in terms of uh, the success with the students and higher engagement and whatnot. So, you know, I make apps to teach um, some computer science concepts. I make apps to teach uh, adults literacy. And um, the results in a nutshell are that um, these tablet apps have really effectively engaged the learners. Um, and from my perspective as an instructor, they act as a force multiplier. That's kind of like a military term. Um, but basically, by having 50 students all with an iPad in their hand, that iPad, when they go to understand a concept, is going to be correcting their understanding. And for some students, that's enough. And that saves me having to go around to 50 students and correct that understanding, uh, which allows me to focus in on like the three or four students that it's not doing it for them. They're having trouble for some reason. And it acts as this huge force multiplier. Like I could handle double the class size if I had iPads in there than if I didn't, because the iPads are doing half of my work for me. They're doing half of the correcting of students for me. So we have to be open to uh, lowering costs that way. So, all right, so this is a lot of pie in the sky stuff. Um, what can you do to help uh, push along uh, a tech? You can learn to code yourself and you can get into this yourself. Um, if you're ever curious about doing that, just uh, contact me. I'd be happy to let you know about the different ways you can do that around here. Um, but more importantly, because I mean this is a bit more realistic, you can very directly make sure that the next generation um, at least has some exposure to code and to uh, programming and to um, software. So there are a lot of opportunities that are new opportunities to get your feet wet in this field. Uh, the community has responded to this uh, demand for more developers with um, new initiatives to handle this. So there's some great online opportunities now to learn coding. There are things like Code Academy and Khan Academy where you can go on there and learn JavaScript and learn some different programming languages and it very much walks you through it. Uh, if you want to get kids into coding, Scratch and Alice are two systems. They're, they're kind of like, they're similar ideas, uh, but more aimed at uh, children. They're, more, they're a little bit more fun and animated. Um, you know, you can get your kids involved in those things. Um, there's also now numerous local in-person opportunities to learn and to seed interest. And many are aimed at children. And don't just bring your own, bring your nieces and nephews, bring their friends, make it a social thing. Um, just, I'll go over a few examples. Um, one is called Ladies Learning Code, very, very cool. Uh, it's for women and men. It's a day-long workshop to learn coding. It's a very good way to get your feet wet if you're curious yourself. Uh, you make a website in a day, you make a WordPress website in a day, you do some JavaScript programming in a day, and it really gets your feet wet. 
Uh, another initiative that's happening now is called the Hammertown Coder Dojo. This one is for children. Um, so children sit down in a computer lab with their parent, they work through some kind of program together, they build a game together. Uh, it's, it's very fun and it's very social. Um, that's another initiative that's going on, so just Google Hammertown Coder Dojo. Another program that's happening is uh, McMaster Software Outreach. Um, they do some uh, activities during the summer that you can enroll kids in, and they also have, uh, they, it's a new program, they've, they're now busing kids in Hamilton to McMaster campus and having them uh, make games and, and do cool kind of programming together. Um, so these are great grassroots options. Uh, what about like, you know, big policy changes that need to happen? This isn't really um, totally my area of expertise, but one great example that I'd love to see emulated in Hamilton, but also like everywhere, uh, the UK has this Code Clubs initiative, and they're trying to get a coding club into an after-school coding club into every single uh, elementary school in, in their country, in, the, in their, uh, and uh, we, we could be doing something similar here. We could put a code club in every, in every school here and reap the benefits of that. Um, so that's just one example. So there's no single silver bullet policy to fixing this problem, but um, we could support something like the UK code clubs. We could, uh, other policies that would be beneficial would be getting some kind of cost saving and evidence back technology into classrooms to like lower costs, allow us to uh, make better use of our resources. We do need to put more emphasis on these college programs, especially for people that are even le leaving university, that they've got their degree, okay, great. Um, you know, now go into college and do your two-year diploma and you know, get a bit more career-oriented education. And we need to increase our focus on adult learning because we can't just leave people stranded after they've done the traditional elementary school to high school education system. So, uh, just closing statement, um, these are kind of big scary forces that are out, of, are out of our control. I'm nervous about putting up a slide that says 50% of people are going to be out of a job in 20 years. That's kind of like, what a jerk. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but I know these are big scary forces, but we shouldn't look at this as a danger. We should look at this as a great opportunity. Because um, Waterloo's there, they're, they're creating these 2,000 tech jobs, they have this very prosperous economy. And we're getting there. It's going to take us time, but we have very clear growth here. We are getting there and we're going to do this, because this is Hamilton. So, that's it. Thanks. <laughs>